okay, uh, I was kind of sick, so I was pretty out of it, but uh, let's try and do this anyway. So this is CS4510. Uh, uh, I think it's 3 1. And I'm only going to cover one thing in this first part today, which is our last uh, uh, regular deciding structure, and it's going to be a segue into the next th kind of things we want to study. So, uh, grammar is a tuple of V, Sigma, P, and S. And now what are those? V is a set of non-terminals. Sometimes these are called variables. And these are always capitalized. Capitalized. Sigma, you know and love, is the alphabet. But here in the context, I'm going to call it a set of terminals. And these are always lowercase. So if I give you an uppercase or a lowercase and I don't say what it is, you can assume that uppercase is a non-terminal and a lowercase is going to be a terminal. P, now this is the important part, a set of productions. Uh, and our limitation on the set of productions is our... Uh, is what defines the type of grammar we have. Right. So uh, a production is a, some uh, something like A goes to uh, B, C. So there's some left hand, there's an arrow, and then there's some right hand. I'm being kind of vague, but I'll explain more. And then S is a start non-terminal. And let this grammar be G. So we say we we say that uh, G produces uh, a string only if uh, you can write that string as a set of productions uh, from the start state. Uh, you. Uh, can write it, um, how should I say this? We say G produces a string if and only if you can write it uh, after a sequence of applied productions. Now, uh, that might not make any sense, but let's do an example. That's the, that's the best way. So let our grammar G, let G equal, uh, we have the set of productions, uh, sigma is 0, 1. Let's just say we have S goes to 1 S and S goes to epsilon. So those are two production rules. That's the empty string. Um, so what does this mean? What kind of strings does this grammar produce? So the language of G of this grammar is then going to be things like uh, well, it's going to produce epsilon, All right? So if we start with the start symbol, when I do a, an implies error like this, this means I apply one production rule. So let's say I apply this first rule. So I replace every instance of I uh, place one instance of S with from the left hand side to the right hand side. So what that means is I get this. Then if I apply the production rule again, this is going to give us, I'm going to apply this rule to this one. One, and you can think of it like parentheses, one, S, right? <coughs> but there's no parentheses. That's just to, you know, maybe help you think. And then let's say I choose this epsilon. Oops. Okay, so one one 
is produced by this grammar. Therefore, 1-1 one, one is in the language of this grammar. From this, maybe you could see that I could generalize this, and you could say uh, that this language is the strings of all ones. Of all uh, of any string of ones, right? So, first thing to notice is that this is a sort of non-deterministic structure, uh, because when you're given a variable with two uh, left-hand sides, you get to choose which one you pick. So that sort of seems non-deterministic by nature, right? So now. Uh, we say, I'll write it as this way, uh, uh, definition, uh, of a regular grammar. Man, that's terrible. Okay. We uh, say uh, grammar is right regular <coughs> if uh, productions in P are only of the form so these are the only kinds of rules we're allowed to have we can have one non-terminal go to a uh, terminal and a non-terminal we can have one non-terminal go to a terminal or we can have a non-terminal go to the empty string those are the only three of rules we're allowed to have it's called right regular because the way we put this first rule if we were instead to have, like, if you were to have a rule like that, those would be called left regular. But we don't particularly care. Now, I claim, and you may have sort of thought this already, you may have jumped ahead because you've had some pattern recognition of the way I've introduced topics, but the grammars of this form are exactly the ones which are correspond to regular languages. So any grammar that has production rules of this form corresponds to regular languages. Now, that might just be believable. If you don't and you don't care about the proof but the proof uh and that's good because the proof is messy and unnecessarily boring right it's there's a lot of minute details so i'm only going to do half of it what i would have to do the technical way to do this proof is you have four cases four four things you first show for any grammar you make an, uh, an nfa and then you prove set containment both ways so that's two parts then you prove for any nfa or dfa you make a grammar uh, regular grammar and then you show set containment again twice so I'm only going to prove it for half of it and the, the other half is sort of obvious in the same direction with one quick catch so I'll, I'll just leave that to you but I'll prove that every uh, regular grammar uh, has an NFA okay now let's uh, get into uh, the thick of it uh, uh, for all uh, regular grammars, uh, there exists an NFA N uh, such that the language of the grammar is equal to the language of the NFA. So there is a NFA for each grammar, for each regular grammar, excuse me. So, uh, first what I'm going to do is, well, we have a grammar is going to be of the form, what is it, V, sigma, terminals, non-terminal, uh, non-terminals, terminals, production rules, and our start state, and an NFA has the form, let's see if you remember, sigma, Q, Q0, uh, delta, that's the good, that's the important one, and then the final states. So, we can define this NFA in terms of this G, so let's just do it, sigma, same right you just move it on over q is equal what we're going to do is assign one state per non-terminal plus an extra state 
right? So what that means is uh, is equal to V uh, union uh, A, where A is an extra state. So uh, Q0 is equal to state corresponding to the start state. <coughs> now recall in an NFA uh, that uh, recall that each uh, delta for anything is actually a set. Right? And then for each set of rules in P, we're going to make uh, some conditions on our transition function. So for all, uh, if the if the if we have rules of the form, uh, uh, let's see, let's see, B goes to A C, uh, then we have uh, the transitions delta of uh, B on A contains C. And then if we have rules of the form B goes to A, then Delta of B goes to A contains A, our extra state. And then if we have rules of the form, uh, well, for each, and this, in, this step includes, includes uh, if A equals the epsilon, right? So that, take care, that takes care of that one. Uh, and then we're going to add... Uh, for all a, let me up here. For all a in uh, sigma, uh, define the em the uh, extra state from a to equal the empty set. So there are no outgoing transitions uh, from this dummy state. So that's our delta, and then finally we need f. F is then just equal to our dummy state. So basically, it makes sense that we should never leave this dummy state because it's the final state, right? So that's what that means. Now, this is just the construction of the NFA from the grammar. I haven't proved it's correct at all. So let's just do that. So uh, we're going to show this, this direction first. We're going to show every word in the grammar is actually uh, decided By the NFA. So uh, let x is equal to, let's say, a1 to a n. And x is in the language by the grammar. So then, because x is in the grammar, then there exists a production of it, right? So then there exists a production. of x uh, like this. It looks kind of like this. We're going to go from s. We're going to go to uh, a1, some some capital A1. We're going to go to a2, uh, excuse me, a1, a2, a1. We're going to go to just, we're going to keep sort of applying those rules to the end until we have a1, a2, dot, 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 applies. Uh, a n minus 1 capital a n minus one and then we apply the last production rule and we're going to get x so we're going to say this is just x right so in our definition then a1 is an element of the starts of the transition from the start state on seeing a1 as defined right And it's, it's similarly for all i. So a i is uh, an element of a i minus 1 a i. Right. So this is the structure of the NFA. If we're at state uh, a i minus 1, excuse me, there should be a delta here. Yeah, it's kind of 
Let me just erase. Oh, that's not delta. Okay, so if we're at AI minus one and we see an AI, then we go to state AI. We can go to state AI, right? Then from this, it should follow that if we're at state S and we see uh, the, the sequence A1 through AN, then uh, from, I'm going to write it like this. So if we're at, uh, from state S, we see X should arrive at A. But A is a final state, which implies that uh, uh, A, that, uh, excuse me, X is accepted by the language of N. Sometimes you can write this like A is an element of delta S comma X. And X here is a string, is a, is a string. So we haven't talked about what this means. This should only be defined for letters of the alphabet. But basically it means exactly what you think. Like what's the states we could be at uh, if we see that exact production? If we see that exact string, right? What are the set of states we could be at? And A is one of them. And because there exists a path to an accept state, uh, X has to be in the language. Okay, so we're going to... Now let's do the other case that the language of N is a subset of the language of our regular grammar. Um, so actually, let's do cases. Let's say, let's say if X was the empty string, uh, then because it's decided by this NFA, then the accepting state must be in the transition function to find this way from the start state on epsilon, right? There must be an epsilon transition to there. Uh, but by construction, this must imply that uh, that S produces uh, the empty string in the grammar. So if X is the empty string, then we're good. Now, if X is not the empty string, uh, we have a, uh, it's slightly more interesting. We have... Uh, there exists a sequence of states uh, S A one dot 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 A N minus one A, right? And because it is accepted by this NFA by uh, our assumption, then the final state must be uh, the accept state. And the sequence is true such that uh, that a one is from the start state, right? And each is, you know, as defined previously. So a i uh, is in delta of a i minus one, comma a i. Right. So as you see. Uh, each symbol in X, you go to this next this next state in this in this specific way, but then this implies uh, we have a production in our grammar, and that's going to look like uh, S produces. It's going to look the same actually. A one A one produces A one A two A two produces dot 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 produces a1, a2, dot, 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 a n minus 1, a n minus 1, produces x. Which then that implies that uh, x is in the language of the grammar. So because it's produced by the thing. So now we've shown correctness of this, which is a little tricky. For every, now we know for every grammar, there exists an NFA for that's equivalent to it. I haven't shown for any NFA you can do a grammar, but the idea is very similar. It's almost the same. Uh, you just need to reverse the way that you defined the uh, transition function and the set of states and everything. Uh, but it's sort of boring and it's kind of like you know plumbing. It's not. It's not too interesting. So, uh, 
This is the last thing we'll do on uh, regular grammars. And now let's move into more interesting grammars. There are a lot more interesting things to do with grammars. Okay, uh, let's move on to something else. Maybe by now you're bored of context, excuse me, of regular languages. Um, I could never get bored of them, but you know, we have to grow up and move on to other things. So now let's talk about another kind of uh, thing, computational model. It's again a grammar. The regular grammar was really an introduction into this. So we say we we call it a, a CFG, and what that stands for is a context uh, free grammar. And uh, what it is, it's just a grammar like before. So we have non-terminals, we have terminals, we have a set of production rules, and a start state. But what makes this different than a regular grammar is that uh, P uh, has productions of the form uh, one non-terminal to any string of uh, terminals and non-terminals. So I could write that as like uh, a goes to V union uh, or non-terminals plus our non-terminals star, right? So here's an example of, of one. Let's say A goes to B, C, D, D, E, F. Who cares, right? This is an example of a valid rule in a context-free uh, grammar, right? So that was also a definition. This is also a definition. Uh, we say uh, context-free language CFL. So uh, we say L is a CFL if there exists a CFG G such that the language of the grammar is our language. So context-free grammars produce context-free languages, right? So let's immediately relate this to regular languages. Every regular Relang regular language is context free. And it, it just follows from the fact that every regular grammar is also context free grammar, right? A context free grammar is just like a loosening of the restriction, one of the restrictions that we had on a context free grammar, right? So it's sort of, you can think of like the every DFA is an NFA kind of thing. Every regular grammar happens to be a context-free grammar as well. Okay, so from this, it follows that the language of the regular, I'll write it as, I'll write it as NFAs, the language uh, decided by the NFAs, the regular languages, is then a subset of the language decided by the context-free grammars, right? But is the converse true? This is a stronger model, you know? Do we get, would I have done this proof like a thousand times show equivalence in the so far what I would do is I show this statement and then I show the converse so we have you know uh, set containment both ways and then we have equality but the converse here what's interesting to me this is not true here uh, there exists L in um, uh, L of CFG which is not in L of NFA 
proof? Well, I let L. Well, let, let's just make the grammar first. So uh, let's go from a start state to 0s1, and then from a start state to epsilon. Now, sometimes what you can do is instead of writing it like this, you can write just an or here and write epsilon. And this is implicit that s goes to this or this. So you, it's like you have another rule, right? So this is a context-free grammar. Clearly, s goes to a string of terminals and non-terminals. Uh, but what language does it produce? So if I were to produce, let's produce some, some strings. So let's say s, then we go to 0, s, 1, then we go to, we're going to re sub replace this uh, string s with the string 0, s, 1, goes to 0, s, 1, excuse me, 0, 0, s, 1, 1, which goes to 0, 0, 0, s, 1, 1, 1. And then that goes to, we're just going to get, now we're going to choose epsilon 1, 1, 1. So then here, here, let's say this is G. The language of G is equal to 0 to the n, 1 to the n, uh, such that n is any integer. Which we know is not regular, because we pumped it. Right? So... Clearly, we have a quote-unquote model of a computer that is stronger than DFAs. So, we have something that can recognize more languages than DFAs. And it can recognize everything that a DFA can recognize. So, that makes it a stronger computer. It can solve more problems than uh, DFAs can. Right? If you notice sort of here, this problem requires counting, quote-unquote. You sort of have to, if you think about programming this, you sort of have to keep a variable. Imagine like you're writing Python, okay? <coughs> you sort of have to keep a variable. If you're trying to, you know, decide if this is in this language or not, you have to keep the variable. Uh, you count the zeros, then you count the ones, you check if they're equal. But a DFA really can't count arbitrarily high. Meanwhile, here in the grammar, we can sort of implicitly count. When we pump, we're keeping track of the left. We're, by this rule, what this means is we every time we add a zero, we also add a one. So set the number of zeros and the number of ones are always equal. Then because they're both on this on different sides, we guarantee that they're separated. So this highlights a sort of important point about grammars, is that they're really kind of creative. They're really difficult to design. So DFA is makes sense to what I call it CS brain syndrome, where everyone Everything everyone has ever understood a problem to be to be is in the context of like a programming interview where a grammar is like not that. So a, a DFA makes sense because you it's like a function. It's like you you it returns a boolean. It's like you take in an input and then you say yes or no. A grammar is not really that. It's not like you are given the string and then you get to check if it's produced by the thing. The grammar just sort of naturally generates the string. It's sort of like instead of you have the string and you start cutting it up from the outside in, the grammar is like from the inside out. Uh, so I think a lot of people have trouble with grammars because they, they have to turn off the CS brain syndrome and start thinking like they don't know what string they're going to produce until they produce it. So I will say manually checking if a given string is produced by a grammar is a little bit of work because there's a lot of branches you have to explore. And again, this is also a non-deterministic structure. Why? Because you get to choose you when to stop puffing S here, right? We, we, we produced S, and then until I chose the second rule, you know, I had to make that choice. So it is non-deterministic uh, by nature. Okay, uh, now let's just do several examples. So um, let's do L equals uh, x in sigma such that uh, x has same I'll write it this way has the same number of zeros as ones so hash one means the number of ones in x right so 
We're going to do a similar idea to the last grammar, but we're going to just sort of rest we don't care if there's a one or a zero on either side, right? So what we do is as long as as long as we keep it constant. So we're going to go s goes to uh, let's do zero s one, but then we might need might want to flip them. So we can do one s not little s s zero, and then as we sort of push to the left and the right as we produce that, they're going to be equal. But then we need to terminate. And so if we just go s to epsilon, then we only have even strings, which is fine, actually. Looking at it closer, if there's an equal number of zeros and ones, then they, the string has to be of even length, right? Otherwise, it would be odd. You can't put an odd number in two. So then this just goes to epsilon. If I wanted to have, like, uh, we can, let's just do another example. We can do palindromes, right? Right, so this is w w r, such that uh, w is a word in sigma star, and we can do that by uh, s goes to uh, zero s zero, or s uh, goes to one s one, and because palindromes can be even or odd, we need to terminate. So we can either terminate with a one. A zero or an epsilon so it's a similar idea now let's do um, maybe a trickier one let's do L is equal to uh, a well defined parentheses strings right that's sort of hard to define formally what a well-defined string is oh with parentheses but you know what it is when you see it right it's something like uh, uh, that's well defined you know the first symbol has to be um, open and this and the last one has to be closed right so here's a well-defined one here's a not well-defined one so these are good and then here's here's a not well-defined one right so it's several conditions the number of open and closed must be equal uh, and then if you have a close it has to match some previous open right so you can't have uh, as you go through the string the number of closed should be less than the number of opens so far right so if you had want dun dun and there were some other things you already know this is wrong so it's kind of hard for me to formalize this, but I'm sure you could do it. Uh, but as a grammar, it's it's not obvious, but it's very uh, sort of like welcoming. So what the grammar looks like is like, well, we need to have one parenthesis for every closed parenthesis, right? So we're going to sort of recursively do it like this, yes, right? Uh, now, if we just left it as that, and then... Uh, eventually s goes to epsilon if we did it just as that then this would only be of the form right we could not get something like this so we need a way to have these like nest so what we're going to do is then just do ss right and that ends up being sufficient and then s goes to epsilon so technically the empty string is also a well-defined string of parentheses so that's that's uh these are some quick examples uh we'll just do one more example for fun x equals sigma star this is like a relaxation of the palindromes one right so s goes to uh, 0 s uh, or 1 s or epsilon right sort of like the ref you think of like a regular grammar but you could do it quote unquote faster as a context free grammar by doing s goes to 0 s 1 uh, 0 s 0 1 s 0 1 s 1 0 1 epsilon and then i could make it even so this will produce the produce it with half as many steps right at the cost of having it like a lot more rules and then i could do it again i could say you know 
Let's make another grammar for sigma star, but then I do all substrings of length two on both sides, all possible combinations of that, right? And that, that you know, the rules were that I don't even want to think it would be a lot more. I think this is it would be exponential in the growth if you were to take that, but they generate the same thing, right? So these are some sort of trivial examples where this only non-terminal is the uh, start state. So let's m do some examples now that have that are like less than non-trivial. Okay, here's an example of uh, another grammar. So I'm going to do uh, arithmetic strings over multiplication and addition. So like a well-defined string um, that you could plug into a calculator, right? So I'm going to say E, which stands for expression. So that's the start symbol. Uh, we want to be able to add uh, lower things to it. So the things, the, this hierarchy here is going to be expressions, terms, and factors. Right? So uh, with an expression, we can go to an expression plus a term or just a term. Uh, from a term, we can go to a uh, term times a factor or just the factor and then uh, from the factor we can go back to the expression in parentheses or we can go to a uh, we're all a and sigma so our non-terminals are actually just a uh, yeah so 0 or 1 or whatever right so this produces strings. Uh, let's produce a string. So let's say E goes to uh, E plus T, which I'm going to then substitute this T for F. So, well, let's go to T times F just to make things interesting. We'll then go to uh, E plus T times f then we'll take t to f so we have e plus f times f and then we'll go from e to t t to f so then you can you can see that it works and then we'll take uh, a all the f's to a real quick so i'll just skip several steps we go to f nope a plus a times a so that's one thing that's generated with this grammar right um that would plug into a calculator and it would give you an answer it might the calculator might not respect order of operations uh but that's okay uh now here's another example of a context-free language uh so this is what you, a calculator could use a context-free language, a grammar like this, to sort of parse the input, right? So you generalize that. Uh, I th I'm going to say most because I'm not 100% sure of every single programming language, but most uh, programming languages are context-free. Now, if you were to dig into the mechanics of the programming language is if you were to dig really really deep into you know like c++ has like an 800 page specification or something they will give you uh the grammar as a text file and like what the rules are and how to produce it and you know a, a valid c++ program is something that's generated then by that string by that grammar excuse me it would be the programming the program would be a string generated by that grammar right so most and you know context free language context free grammars are very useful for the compiler to parse uh your program into something that the compiler knows how to do right if you have a plus a in your program then the compiler sees a and then it's like oh well this is actually some other rule so then it's going to inherit it right so how it's that's the way it knows that a plus a it can understand a plus a and a plus a plus a uh without having a fixed rule for both of those right it's generative this way Here's another uh, example, English. 
So English, uh, Chomsky in his book, Syntactic Structures, where he invents all this stuff, he uh, gives a well-defined grammar for the English language using his non-terminals are then noun, and then the noun goes to a list of every single noun or something, right? So like the, the noun goes to a list of all nouns. You're right. So then uh, verbs go to a list of all verbs. And then like a sentence could be, and or adjectives go to a list of all adjectives. And then a rule could be, you know, term goes to adjective noun, right? So like very green or something. I was never too good at English. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so English is context free in this sense. But there's two things to note about that. Uh, one, things that are grammatically correct. There are surprising things which are grammatically correct. For example, you might have heard of the sentence buffalo, 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 buffalo. Maybe that's the number of buffaloes, but that, and you're like, well, how, that doesn't make any sense to me. But under uh, Chomsky's grammar, that is a valid gr grammatically correct sentence, right? Doesn't mean someone will understand what you say when what you mean when you say it, but it's technically correct English. You know, so our definition here of correct is then follows from the grammar, right? And second, there are sentences that are grammatically correct, but are which don't make sense, right? So the the classic example was uh, colorless uh, green ideas sleep sleep sleep. Uh, furiously. So, this is a grammatically correct sentence under Chomsky's grammar, but it doesn't make any sense. There's not really a sentence or a context you can come up with where the sentence might make sense, similarly with the buffalo sentence. But it demonstrates an important point, and there is, there's a, a difference between syntax and semantics. So, I'll say syntactics and semantics. So there's a difference between the way you write something and what something means. So you cannot use a grammar. Well, he showed. We won't show, but you cannot use a grammar uh, to construct like the meaning of things, the meaning of English. What's what a sentence, the value of it has. You can produce what the correct sentences are, but you cannot produce the sentences, uh, which are clear, the, the semantic sentence, the ones that the sentences that make sense then would be a subset of this, right? You can't produce those with the grammar. So another way I could sort of explain that is like uh, the study of sentence uh, structure is independent of the study of meaning. Okay, I'm going to leave you with uh, one last idea here. Well, really two. So let's give a definition. Uh, uh, derivation is considered leftmost if at each production step you produce produce a produce the leftmost non-terminal so it's obvious, sort of, right? You just you don't get to choose. You just uh, which what you uh, replace the non-terminal with. You get to choose, but you don't get to choose which non-terminal you have to replace, right? So that's what we say a leftmost derivative. So if a string is leftmost der uh, derived from a grammar, that's what we mean. Similarly for rightmost, right? So we say. Uh, Grammar is 
ambiguous, big word here, if there exists two leftmost derivations for the same string. Now, what that really means is that when we produce a string, there's more than one way to produce it leftmostly. Uh, it's best explained for parse trees. So let's let's just let's make a grammar that I think is ambiguous. S goes to let's do S A S or S B S or C. Okay. Now instead of producing this normally, what I'm going to do is write uh, what's called a parse tree, right? So that's the other thing I'm teaching is not just ambiguous grammars, but there's a, you know, the existence of parse trees. So what that means is we start with the root up here, that's S. Then what I'm going to do is at the next level, I'm going to write uh, S A S, right? So there's a flow downwards to as I produce it. Uh, then I'm going to produce this one to be um s b s and this should produce i'm going to say well s can only go i'm going to just say that goes to uh c a c b uh c so this is a sort of a, a parse tree by the way is a proof that a uh string is produced by a grammar it's the same as the production rules, but it, it makes more sense, I think, to visualize this spatially. Now, I, I claim this string can be produced uh, again, right? So let's do a different parse tree. Let's do S goes to um, S B S. Right, uh, and then we're going to produce this one. Oh, sort of, I didn't do a leftmost derivation here because I kind of looked ahead, but this one I was only going to produce to a single letter anyway, so it doesn't matter. This one then I'm going to produce to S A S, and then produce this one to C, that brings down S I'm going to produce to C, this one I'm going to produce to B, and this one I'm going to produce finally to uh, C. Right, so let me go ahead and draw those lines. Okay, so we have two parse trees for the same word in the language. That means this language is ambiguous. Most of the languages that we care about are ambiguous, and proving a language is ambiguous or not ambiguous is actually really hard and not something that we care about too much in this class. So it's just worth mentioning, though, you know, that there are more than ways to do something. So similarly, how in an NFA, a string can have more than one accept state, but it just has to have one, right? As long as there's one way to produce it, it's in the language. It doesn't mean you can't produce it more than one way.